Greetings, everyone. It's good to see you all on this uh, Bible study of Romans. I'm so glad that you can join me again, and I hope that uh, if you're one of the faithful ones who ha has been tuning in uh, every week for this uh, Bible study, we uh, thank you for your dedication and loyalty and your commitment to uh, studying God's Word with us. Um, we are uh, going to jump in today to, uh, with a session we're going to call Our Spiritual Identity Part 2, Part 2. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically use my, my hand out here to walk through it with you instead of loose leaf paper with my writing, which uh, I always have fun with. Um, before we begin, um, I've gotten a question of what Bible I'm using. And uh, just to let you know, this is the um, New, uh, New, Oxford, uh, New Oxford Annotated uh, Bible. Uh, NRSV, New Revised Standard Version. So that's the one I'm using. And today we're going to be in chapter 7, as we did, of course, chapter 5 and 6 last week. Just to review, last week we did, uh, when we did 5 and 6, it was spiritual identity part 1. We talked about um, how Paul is moving this group into a place of, of, of recognizing who the true enemy is. It's not one another, but rather it's sin's dominion um, and uh, Christ's triumph. So what Paul does is he introduces um, he introduces uh, words that take on the language of warfare in talking about our spiritual life. First thing to do is acknowledge God, then to acknowledge your sinfulness, and then to acknowledge the true battle that lies within us, which is that war between flesh and spirit. And so as as Paul makes his way through the spiritual identity, he establishes that particular foundation as well as our response, which is to baptism uh, through faith and baptism. And he talks about baptism as being included. And then goes on to talk about the work of the Spirit, which is sanctification, which is uh, chapter 6, verse uh, 19. All right, uh, one of the things, the, the, other, the other thing I want to note before we jump into 7 is that I am battling some noise. You're going to hear a compressor in the background. I apologize about that. You may not hear it. I don't know. I'll have to see how it plays back. But uh, one of the things that we're doing is uh, pressure washing and painting the church today. So you'll have to put up with those noises. All right. Chapter 7, Spiritual Identity Part 2, is ultimately moving us into our relationship with Christ. We have the foundation in Chapter uh, 6. Then we're moving on to Chapter 7 with talking about our identity in Christ. Okay? The first eight verses, which we're going to study, talks about um, uh, it gives images of what that relationship to Christ might look like. So let's read and then uh, go from there. Okay, chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who, are, who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only during that person's lifetime? So what we're doing here is Paul is shifting to speaking to those who know the law. Basically, people, uh, the, Jew, the Jewish Christians... He's doing this primarily to uh, af affiliate with the Jewish Christians. He's saying, look, I'm, I'm one of you, okay? Um, this term, do you not know brothers and sisters, it's literally my, my brothers or my, my friends. Do you not know my friends? So this, um, even though we see brothers and sisters a lot in Paul's writings, this is a term of endearment because he includes the, the preface my, my friends. So it's not just do you not, do you not know brothers, but it's, do you not know my brothers, my brothers and sisters, for I'm speaking to those who know the law. So he's turning an intimate corner here, but he is also speaking to the Gentiles because as he is speaking to the Jews, the Jewish Christians, he is expecting the Gentile Christians to overhear, and then he'll return to both camps in chapter 8. Um, that the law is binding. Okay. Thus a married woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is discharged from the law concerning the husband. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. In the same way, my friends, um, this, by the way, is the same term of endearment. So, in, in the translation, it would have been better for this translation to do these, my friends, twice to keep it consistent. Uh, you have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to one another. To him who has been raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. While we were living in flesh, our sinful passions 
aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we are slaves not under the written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. All right, let's stop there. So one of the things that we're, we're talking about here is our identity in Christ and images of what that relationship to Christ looks like. The first image, which we have here, two uh, to three, is that of marriage. Uh, back in the old ancient days, um, if you were uh, a man, uh, Moses' law, in particular Deuteronomy 24, and, uh, and Jewish law, uh, the oral law, gave men the right or the, the uh, ability to get a divorce. That was not so for women. Now, in the Roman law, okay, not Jewish law, but Roman law, Roman law allowed both men and women to file for divorce. But we're talking to the Jews here. So what he's doing is he's saying, thus a married woman, he's not talking about a married man who is bound by the law, but a married woman, because a woman cannot, according to Jewish custom, get a divorce if she were to divorce, okay, um, and, and say live with another um, or, or somebody who's not her husband, she would be an adulteress. However, uh, if her husband dies, then she is free to free from that, that, that covenant and able to marry another. So when you look at this language of adultery and marriage, it only focuses on the women because he is talking about a person who is bound by law to remain married. Um, she would not have a choice to divorce. So the only way she is allowed to remarry is in the case of a death of a widow, um, or I'm sorry, in the death of her husband. Uh, if you read Jesus' own statements on divorce, say in Matthew 19.3 or Mark 10, uh, verse 2, Jesus says that um, divorce is something to avoid un except in cases of adultery or immorality. And... Um, there's a whole discussion on divorce that we can get into, but that's outside of our purview. Uh, one of the things about Jesus is that when he um, talks about divorce, he does it in a way to protect the rights of women. And um, if you look at both Matthew 19 and Mark 10, he addresses divorce primarily to protect women uh, because they were the ones who could not get a divorce and were usually victims of men who were leaving them. And then children, both vulnerable people in his in Jesus' society. So that's a little fact. But what we're talking about here is marriage as a model for relating to God. The law bound the people of Israel, but with the coming of Jesus and the law of faith, which Paul talks about previously, um, people are no longer bound by that law because Jesus was the ultimate uh, sacrifice. The next uh, image we have when you go through verse 4 is that of an agricultural um, metaphor. It talks about how if we're raised uh, um, together with Christ into the new life of Christ, then we begin to bear fruit for God. Now, this has uh, kind of a double meaning, bearing fruit as a result of the marriage with God, as a result of relationship with God, as in uh, bearing offspring or, or new life. Uh, and then bearing fruit also has with it a, a, an agricultural metaphor that brings us back to chapter 6, verse 5, when uh, Paul talks about we being planted or rooted with Jesus in his death like his. So you have to remember, even though we're going from one chapter to the other, the metaphors blur together. So another image is an agricultural image, which, by the way, he's going to bring up again back in uh, when we get to Romans 9, 10, and 11 of being rooted into uh, grafted into uh, the people of Israel so that we might bear fruit for God. And then the third image within this section is that of slavery. He says that we are no longer slaves to the law, but now slaves to the life in the spirit. Uh, slavery um, uh, back then was, again, uh, uh, you, you were a slave because you were either a prisoner of war some were slaves because of indentured uh, servanthood. They went into debt. Or some people uh, were born into it. And, um, and in some ways, uh, being a slave, again, tied you to your master. And we already know that in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul calls himself a servant or a slave of God. And so he uses that metaphor to say that life in the spirit 
means that we, our identity, uh, all of who we are, our life, our history, our identity is wrapped up in Christ. Slaves had no life or identity or history apart from their master. And so that's another metaphor uh, that he uses. Um, and, uh, and then he moves into his, his next uh, part of the argument. We're going to read verse 7 and 8 and just talk for a minute about that. What then should we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to cover, uh, to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. Now what is he saying here? He's saying that the law itself is not sinful. However, uh, the law itself is not sinful. However, um, the law defines what sin is. So he's using coveting as an example. He would not have known coveting if the law did not say you shall not covet. And so in that definition of sin or that law, sin seizes an opportunity in the commandment producing this word again, bringing up uh, some agricultural metaphors, all kinds of covetousness. Uh, the old uh, saint, uh, John, uh, Saint John Chrysostom, once likened the law to a doctor who prohibits you from eating something. The doctor is not evil. But once he prohibits, say, a certain food, all you think about is that food. If he didn't prohibit the food, then you probably wouldn't think about it, and you probably wouldn't you know, crave it. But when a doctor denies you something, again, it's not the doctor who's evil, but it's the... Uh, it's the very thing that you want to do. And, and that's how Paul pitches sin and this dominion of sin is that, that drive. And the law as that which defines the sin. Living now into the newness of the spirit, you are no longer enslaved by those cravings. You're no longer defined by those prohibitions, but rather defined by serving Christ, by being in relationship with Christ, and by doing the work of the spirit rather than work of the flesh. All right, we're going to move to 14 and 15 to, to uh, hit our next section in this. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but you're more than welcome to stop the video and move into it. But we're picking it up at verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want to, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I uh, do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer... I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. And then we'll move down to 21. Okay? So I find, I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God and my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive. It's the word for slavery again. To the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will... Uh, rescue me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. So what he does is he talks about this, di this paradox of law and sin and salvation and freedom in Christ, but then personalizes it. You'll notice that he uses personal language. For we know, okay, in verse 14, and then in verse 18, uh, between verse 14 and 18, he switches to first person. And then verse 18 says, For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. So he's switching from speaking to the community to personalizing how this works. He's given an example, using himself as a mentor or a model of how this war, war works. And you'll notice he spoke in past tense, and now is speaking in present tense, a present condition. I have a good quote here from F.F. Uh, F. Bruce and his um, commentary on Romans and the Tyndale uh, Old Testament commentary, a uh, quote by M. Uh, Goguel that says that this is no abstract argument that Paul is giving, but the echo of a personal experience of an anguished soul. So Paul personalized it. He switches to first person, present tense, to talk about this 
war that is within him that will for, forever, as long as we're on this side of, of earth, this side of heaven, uh, alive uh, both to the spirit but also part of the flesh with that sinful nature, we'll always have that war within us. But if we're always at war within us, then it is at that war as believers that disqualifies us from the grace of God or the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Does the war itself, if we're living in the spirit, kata numa, according to the spirit, somehow make us unworthy of God's love, of that free gift of grace that we have in Jesus Christ through faith? And that's when we get to chapter 8, verse 1, where Paul says now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So yes, there's a war at, at, uh, at work within us. There will always be that war. But even in that present state of anguish, that present state of war, though we are living in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit and being sanctified by the Spirit, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin, or uh, literally to deal as a sin offering. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Uh, you'll see here that this idea of walking in the Spirit is is something that we do. We're, we're living in a pilgrimage of walking with the Spirit. God gave Jesus over, doing away with sin and death so that we might be made righteous through Christ's atonement uh, to have that relationship with God, which, again, Paul likens to a marriage, to, uh, to agricultural uh, metaphor of, of living uh, in Christ to bear fruit for God and as a servant of God in his household, in his body. He even uses the, the idea of, of being a part of the body of Christ in 7.4 so that we might not be condemned because of that war within us, but that we might be freed up even in the midst of that hostility within us to walk with God in the spirit and to grow in him. So that's part two of our uh, uh, spiritual identity is to is to uh, again establish the war within us, uh, the the real enemy that's that's there, sin's dominion. Live into Christ's triumph. That's chapter uh, six. To understand the work of the Spirit of of entering into that covenant with God through baptism, through through uh, faith, that responsive faith. To live into that work of sanctification. Not being brought to a place of perfection, but rather understanding the battle that continually wages uh, war within us, not so that we might find condemnation nor condemn one another, but find freedom in Christ to walk according, not to the flesh, but to the spirit. You're going to find that he continues to talk about spiritual identity through chapter 8. He'll turn to what that means as being a community. Uh, our, our common future in Romans 9 through 11, and then will give us a common purpose as God's beloved, as God's children and God's family in Romans 12 through 15. So I hope that you'll join me next week and next time as we uh, study Romans 8, for it is the really, uh, in, in all practical purposes, purposes the crescendo of, of this section, that we might continue to walk with him and to live according to the spirit rather than according to the flesh. Amen and amen.